So Evan, how are you? Susan, I'm fine. Oh, okay, great. I just want to ask you a few questions about somebody who's near and dear to everybody's heart in mm -hmm. the skeptic community. And um, I know I started um, listening to the SGU many years ago, back when Perry DeAngelis was around, and I was this, I thought he was a really awesome kind of guy, and somebody I would definitely relate to, even though he's on the East Coast and I'm on the West Coast. You know, I thought this is the kind of guy I'd hang out with. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, so I just want to ask you a few questions. Really sure. Back about sure. Okay, so some of the things that I want to know is like, where was, you know, t just tell me a little bit about him, like where was he born, what was, what was his influence, it's that kind of thing. Perry DeAngelis was Connecticut born and raised, probably. Is that right? Uh -huh. Yeah, as, as I was as well. Uh -huh. um, yeah, we, um, I met him because I knew his sister, actually. His sister and I were of an age in which we went to high school together, but Perry being about five years older than me, we never quite hit the schools together at the same time. But it was 1985 when I was speaking with his, his sister Celeste and she told me about him and just from what little she told me, I'm like, oh, I gotta meet this guy because we have some common things and interests. We play the, you know, the same like the tabletop games and some other interests and so forth. And I did, and, I, and the first time I met Perry, in about 30 seconds, I think I realized this is a person I can really, really get along with uh -huh. because we just have so much in common. And he just made you feel, feel so welcome, especially to new people that he would meet. Uh -huh. So, so he was raised in Connecticut, as yep. you were, and did he um, have any influences, you know, we're more interested in the skepticism kind of angle, but mm -hmm. I still, you know, I know he played a lot of games. He did, yes. And um, what was his, more of his influences? Did he, did he start reading Skeptical Inquirer magazine? Because I think what we put on the Novella page, mm -hmm. the Steve Novella page, was that um, he was reading a Skeptical Inquirer, Inquirer magazine and yes. realized at the back of the magazine that there was no group. No skeptics group in that area. Right. That's and he said, "Well, oh, let's just start one." Was it he that kind of guy that just said, just took impossible ideas and just said, "Let's just do it." Pretty much, he was a man of you know large thoughts amongst uh, amongst other things. And yeah, as far as long as I know, I knew him. He was um, you know reading lots of different things, game magazines, but also science magazines, Skeptical uh -huh. Inquirer, and, and and so forth. And you know, but it, we 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 initially you know connected on on a. On not the skeptical level, but on, on other interests mm -hmm. and, and so forth. Um, he's also uh, big into history. Oh, um, I didn't know yeah, that. Tell abs me. Yeah, like, did he have a special area? History? Civil War, mostly. I mean, he was he was uh, almost fanatical about the Civil War. He would. Uh, I don't know that he actually went to any you know recreations of Civil mm -hmm. War activities and stuff, but he would have costume pieces. He would collect like hats and caps and. Um, yeah, you know, banners and, and these sorts of things. He had uh, magazines and some books and obviously a whole collection of VH ta VHS tapes about these things. So he's a big Civil War buff, also World War II as well. And uh, you know, I'm, huh. these are things I'm also interested in, so it was another common point. Was it like a, because you guys are on the East Coast, the Civil War stuff, I mean, did you, were you guys near a site or something that was like really historical that made him? You know, it's, it's funny you say that because, you know, Connecticut obviously being one of the first states in the Union, we have, you know, one of the deepest histories in, mm -hmm. of, of, all the, uh, of all the parts of the, of the country. So, you know, our history and of, the, of those times, Revolutionary War going forward, is something that um, is impressed upon us in our, in our classrooms growing up. There's mm -hmm. always plenty of that to, that, you know, that they teach us and, and that they instill in us. So, you know, from a very young age, myself and Perry and others are, you know, interested in, in, in these sorts of things because, because of, you know, where Connecticut is, one of the original 13 colonies. Uh, I, somebody was just talking to me today, He because um, I live next to, I'm in Steinbeck country, John okay. Steinbeck. I live mm -hmm. like a few blocks from his house. Yep, yep. You know, John Steinbeck, John Steinbeck, but just <laughs> drill it into your head when you're a kid. So, like, of course, you know, we're into the missions of the, mm -hmm. you know, because being in California and stuff, but it's exactly the same thing. You kind of, even though the schools that you say, I'm rebelling against the schools, we can't. I no. mean, they, they drilled it in our heads. So Pretty much, gotta, yeah. They come up with the uh, with the <laughs> curriculum and we have to, you know, follow along. But it's very interesting stuff. <laughs> That's too funny. Yeah, so um, I didn't know this about him, about it being a history buff. Where did, what, what was his day job? What did he do for a living? He worked for his father. His father owned and still does, owns a string of properties. So he's property manager. Oh. Um, you know, shopping centers and these sorts of things, little strip malls along, mm -hmm. you know, Route 1 and, and so forth. So mm -hmm. he would go around and make sure that, you know, the customers, you know, getting what they need. If something needed repair, he would call the repairman and so forth and do those sorts of right. jobs for him. Oh, I didn't. Yes. So, those are those things that people just don't know. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's I, like we, we hear, you hear them on the, the podcast and you're like, 
you know, you hear about monkeys and, and <laughs> birds and monkeys and all these other things, and you're not uh, man purses and stuff like you know. Those are those are great stuff. But, That's right. I mean, it's I only a the, pinhole into the whole. Yeah, person, I mean, you, you don't, don't know see that much what's about, going on around. Did he have any like heroes or influences that you that you know of that were like big deals to him? Who would he really want to met or? Well, you know, he, the our interest in eventually what became our podcast is that. Another thing Perry and I had in common is that we would both listen to uh, radio, mm -hmm. um, not not just music stations, but talk radio on all sorts of things, sports, politics. Um, we would listen to the the car guys who would be talking. Oh, the about, car talk guys. Yeah, the car I talk love guys. Those guys. Those guys. Great. And, and this was even back in the '80s. You know, even before the car talk guys were doing their thing, there were other radio shows out there like that. Plus, we also enjoyed. Uh, the morning shows, you know, the Howard Stearns and the Don Imuses and these sorts of things. So I think these people had an influence certainly on Perry and turned him on to some topics that I don't know that he would have otherwise had exposure mm -hmm. to. So that's really cool to be able to have those kinds of things. Did he have anybody that you really, like anybody you interviewed that he was just like over the, you know, just like, oh my gosh, we're going to have someone, someone? <laughs> was there anything like that? Any favorite interviews? He, he would have liked to have had more people of a political nature on the mm -hmm. show, even though that's not really what our show right. uh, is about. Um, you know, he was, uh, he arranged to, he was the one who arranged in one of our earlier episodes that we had a psychic uh, come on from Pennsylvania, which we interviewed her. It was kind of our first, um, what do you call it, uh, confrontational, although it wasn't really that bad, uh -huh. it's sort of, sort of interview. And he was very excited about that, that, you know, that he, that he actually, you know, got and convinced the psychic from Pennsylvania to come on to the show to talk about it because, you know, they, they, these people who are in the paranormal and things, they see the word skeptic and all, and all of a sudden they kind of turn and run mm -hmm. in more, more cases than not. So that we, and he actually landed that interview. He was, uh, he was pretty proud of himself for that one. <laughs> That's too funny. I didn't have. I didn't know that. Now he did a lecture on cults, right? He did. Can yes. Can you tell me about that? So it's at Southern Connecticut State University, and I think it was about probably 1998 mm -hmm. or so, in which uh, Steve Perry, um, Bob Novella, and uh, John Blumenfeld, who was also part of our local skeptics organization, the four of them went to Southern Connecticut State University to do a day-long series of lectures to the. Um, um, teachers and assistant professors there at the university to teach them about things like critical thinking, analysis of claims, evidence-based versus faith-based, and so forth. And one of the topics that Perry covered specifically was uh, cults and and um, how people are basically drawn into uh, these sorts of these sorts right. of things and um, the needs that people have and how they seek them out in certain venues such as you know cults and. and quasi-religious right. sorts of So he's comfortable speaking in front of people, not just on a radio, because that's a totally different thing. Right. When you're talking to a microphone as opposed to speaking in public, he's well, okay with that? Right, absolutely. And this gets into another point about Perry, which some people didn't know, and I, you know, but they, they may or may not know now, is that you know we're all role players. Uh, you know, We would go and attend these games and assume roles of other people, which is essentially a form of acting, mm -hmm. and getting up and presenting yourself in front of other people. So we you know, got all of that out of our system, any butterflies in the stomach or anything like that, from all of our years of doing this sort of you know, live presentations, mm -hmm. in which you know, a lot of it's even impromptu, no scripts no, to follow or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So it was never a case of, you know, getting up in front of an audience and, and having any sort of reservations or so forth. And you know, as long as we know the material, we're, we're up there and talking about it. Perry was no different. <laughs> what was his favorite tabletop game? Oh, Dungeons and Dragons, most certainly. Really? Yeah. yeah, you know, like all of us of that generation. Because he was born in what year? Thing. Perry was born in 1964. Okay, that's about right. That'd be about right. I remember being getting the Dungeons and Dragons set. I'm born in 62. And, yeah. and I got the Dungeons and Dragons set and I was like, Wait, I don't get this. Wait, wait, wait. you're it supposed to roll. You the only you're one supposed to get monopoly. It. I don't get it. You know, you roll the dice, you move around the board. I didn't quite get this. Wait a minute. He would have funny names for the books, like, oh, here's the Tome of Ultimate Confusion. <laughs> and you, let's look at page 500, maybe over 500 pages in this book. Oh, look at page 489. Oh, this it directly contradicts what you're seeing here on page 200. So you basically had to, right, so I'll just come up with, you know, we'll use this as a basis. I'll, I'll make my own, you know, oh. house rules for, for these sorts of things. Well, it kind of did, it kind of did that. Now, so let me go back to the skepticism. Did he yep. have a, 
So he was he was reading Skeptical Inquirer magazine. Yes, he was. Was there something before that that he was interested in that got him into the kind of the skeptical world? No, not that I'm aware of. I mean, he always had an appreciation and a love of science. That's another thing about you know our Connecticut education is that for as much as history is a big part because of you know where we are on the map, um, science is is also pretty highly valued in, in our education system. You know that may may or may not be the case in other areas. But certainly, you know, science requirements were pretty pretty strong, at least mm -hmm. in those times. They talked to evolution and that kind of thing. But that's right, that's right. And Perry, being the intelligent, rational, reasonable person, you know, was able to say, okay, this makes sense, and, you know, I, I admire this, I realize this is where the rubber meets the road, mm -hmm. and if I need to find a way to explain, you know, the universe to at least himself or myself, um, that, you know, science is probably the best way to go about it as opposed to seeking out a religion, a guru, or some or something else. That makes but, sense. Yeah, ever since I've known him, he was, he was always in no, that mind. The other thing I, I think I'd heard that his wife was a Jehovah's Witness? Yes, that's right. He did marry a Jehovah's Witness who, you know, you, you just... Well, love is, love, you know, who knows, you know, you know? It, it breaks down all sorts of barriers and so forth. But, you know, she, she, he never held his beliefs against her and she never held hers against him, right? That's not where they had their, their, their commonality, right. you know? Obviously, their, their love for each other trumped all of that. And, you know, nothing wrong with that. They were able to deal with it. Um, you know, she had her own little circle in that respect. Perry has a skeptical circle, and but the, the two of them together, you know, they kind of took care of each other, and that's, that's and they had no children, right? No children, no children. Yeah. Yeah. And he was also into sports, baseball, right? Yeah, well, certainly as a um, uh, as a sports fan, and you know, a big Yankees fan. Boy, he would. <laughs> anytime the Yankees were playing. Uh, he would have to be near a radio or a television in order to kind of keep uh -huh. an eye on what uh -huh. was going on. Whether it was, you know, playing a game or we'd be out and about, you know, having dinner and so forth. He would want to, you know, turn on the radio or something. Yeah, let's check the score and see what's going on. Uh -huh. Get very animated, very emotional about uh, about his sports and so forth. And being a Yankee fan and growing up at the time, he uh, had the 1970s in which they had a couple World Series, but then there was a big drought in which they were terrible for a long time until they had kind of a resurgence in the 90s. So for 20 years, Perry was a long-suffering Yankees fan, and he made it known to everybody that he was. But he was always very proud about that. And, uh, you know, we used to go to the games together, too. Mm -hmm. It was one of the other things. Um, so, yeah, he, he did enjoy sports, mostly the Yankees. Oh, wow. I didn't know, I didn't know what team it was because I don't think I really had I'd noticed that. But there's something else I'd heard. He drove um, a demolition... Tell me about this um, driving. These were, in, these were in the years before I knew him, but they were in his later high school years, I believe, junior, junior, senior in high school. And what he would do with some of his friends is they would go and they would buy these wrecked cars for a hundred bucks a pop, you know, basically the things that could barely get up the road. And he would go up to the northern part of Connecticut in which every fall there's a large carnival festival, kind of a Six Flags sort of thing called mm -hmm. um, the Big E. And one of the events there was a demolition derby. So he would, you know, he and a couple of his friends would either, you know, invest in a car together or each of them drive up their own junker, head up there and, you know, sign up to be in the oh demolition derby. And, but he, he took it an extra step because this is, this is the theatrical part of Perry, is that he didn't just go and, you know, put the helmet on and race around. He had, he had to assume a persona. He had to pursue, he, he oh, assumed really? a character called, uh, I think it was Dr. Death or something like that, and he put on scrubs, and he wore a mask, and he had rubber gloves and stuff, and he would get on the hood of his car, and he'd wave to the audience and do all these things, and he would sign his ma autographs with his mask Dr. and Death. hand it Dr. Death. <laughs> so it was the pageantry, it was the display of it all. Wasn't really he good? Oh, uh, you know, again, I, I, unfortunately I never saw him in action, but from what I hear, he really got the crowd riled up, which oh, is typical, I can't imagine. typical Perry. That is <laughs> That's priceless. Typical. Is there anything you can think of that I haven't um, asked you that you know you know people would probably be interested in knowing? I mean, about Perry. Boy, you know, um, I, I only wish, you know, I kind of knew him sooner than, than I did, well, but I did have the fortune we of all, That's how we are with everybody, I know, you know? I know. Now it's like, oh my gosh, I wish I, yeah, that's why you got to do it now. That's right, that's right. Uh, you know, I mean, there's there's the stuff that maybe some people do know or don't know. You know, obviously he helped co-found the, the Connecticut Skeptical Society. Um, he also um, uh, was owned a game shop eventually. Oh, I didn't know that. He went and, you know, yeah, invested mm -hmm. with some friends in that. He also ran some of these live action role playing games that we actually attended and performed in. He became, you know, the, the owner of that. So he actually, you know, 
got into, you know, at the ownership level with some, some of these things. He had to, you know, want some control um, over, over these, these activities and hobbies that he was so passionate about. So he would, you know, have no problem just kind of, mm -hmm. just kind of diving in there. Did he have um, any projects that he didn't get to do that he, you know, he was yeah. really, really interested in? Yeah, yeah, we were going to start a blog together. Um, he and I, right before he, he died, we were, we were uh, brainstorming a blog that dealt with um, skepticism, but the theme of the skepticism would be where this fields of, of skepticism and conservative political thought merge and overlap, which is something that I think a lot of people don't realize that there are certain areas of it that do overlap and they fit quite nicely, but that's not sort of typical of the skeptical community. It's much more liberal based, mm -hmm. um, but I think what we were going to go for was something more along the libertarian line. Oh. which you know we you know is, is a whole conversation unto itself so right. he and I were in the development stages of putting that blog together but unfortunately it, it never really it never really came to be and uh, but you know how about Nexus tell mm -hmm. me about Nexus how is the relationship between Perry DeAngelis and Nexus what's the so, relationship so after Perry died we as just our, our local group and um, the Skeptics Guide to the Universe did an annual um, Perry DeAngelis Memorial show in which we would rent out a little theater mm -hmm. and about 100 people or so you know, come from all over and we'd do a live performance, not unlike what we do here at TAM. On stage, you know, just a live, sh a live show for the audience. And then what happened after that is in order to kind of you know, grab a bigger audience, we became friendly with the New York Skeptics mm -hmm. Association, and obviously we had New England cover, they had New York cover, they said, look, let's like make one regional conference, call it Nexus, the Northeast Conference in Science and Skepticism, mm -hmm. and part of it now is that there's always an homage of some sort to Perry, he's a, he's a part of that now, and uh, every, every time we have Nexus, we always mention Perry and remind people that this is, you know, no small, do no small part of, of his brainstorming and his ideas is the reason why we're actually all here today to, to enjoy the conference. So it's his, it's his, we turned his memorial show into, it evolved into Nexus. So he's, he lives on. Always, always. And that's really the magic of podcasting and, you know, is that it, it immortalizes it, Right. People. I'm sure you hear this all the time, but I've, I've heard this from other people that they have uh, started watching. This. I don't know what it is about skeptics, but we're all this things in order kind of people, you know, mm -hmm. everything's got to be in order. So they start, they find a, like a, a new podcast and they start at the beginning and they go their way through. And then, you know, even now they'll start watching or listening to the SGU at the beginning. And then when they get to the part where Perry dies, it's like they lose it. And it's just really sad. Yeah, it's a real kick in the stomach, but it's also yeah. a testament to how personable he was. What you heard on the show, even though it was a very small sliver of his life, and like I said, like a pinhole in a fabric that you really didn't see all of, you really did get, he was he was himself, and he always was himself. Sure, he was a performer on other levels, and Dr. Death, uh, Dr. Death, or pursued you know, this role and that role, but you know, he, he always kept his wits about him, defining reality from fantasy, right? Characters versus himself, and what you heard on the show was definitely 100% him, and that clearly, I think, shows through, and that's why there's such a strong connection between uh, Perry and the listening audience is you really did get to know him even though it was a small sliver you really did get to know about Perry D'Angelo through the show. Well thank you so much for taking a few minutes. You're I welcome. really appreciate you sitting uh, down and talking. I'm always happy to talk okay. about Perry. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Alright, so you can cut it. Is there anything